the first project or something that's given to you can be so intimidating. They said, our goal is to reach 11 million uh, euros by this month. Go achieve it. And I'm like, okay, but within 10 months, I was able to A, blow that number out of the water, but more importantly, build a stable business. You hear a lot of companies that want their employees to come back into the office. If I have tons of conference calls back to back, what's the point of me being in the office? In terms of your overall career strategy, if you'd ever thought about working with startups since they're also doing some cool, exciting work. I can almost call any CEO and probably get a meeting if I'm saying I'm calling from AWS. If I would be a random startup, I can imagine that would be a bit harder. You know, today uh, this term moonlighting is getting a lot of attention. Let's do things that give us energy and see where they lead us. The more cultures you experience, the more open your mindset becomes in creating new products, creating new services. Shadi.com, would that work in other countries? Would, would that work in other industries? So it sounds like we've all been scarred by Shadi.com in general. Wait, <laughs> I was just going to say, I was wondering where your familiarity came from with Shadi.com. You see a lot of topics and a lot of articles about quiet quitting. I'll, I'll say something controversial about this, but I think people leaving is not a bad thing. Every time I, I achieve a goal that I want, I move my bar away. It has nothing to do with your age. It has nothing to do with what you have achieved. Don't wait for your next job to do your best work. A role is just a title. The title doesn't mean anything. Uh, you're basically saying don't wait to be excellent. Hey everyone, we are back with episode four of the EITF project, and this is an exciting one. For this episode, Nandini, Charu, and I spoke to Katrien Pigner. Katrien started her career at Microsoft. She started out as an opportunity manager, working closely with customers in Belgium and Luxembourg. She spent five years at Microsoft holding multiple roles. The latest one being an enterprise account executive for higher education. She believes in teaching and giving back with what she has learned and is also on the board of directors and advisors for the Auckland ICT Graduate School. After Microsoft, she started her career at AWS and has held multiple roles so far. She started out as a national sales manager for New Zealand before transitioning to a role as a senior sales manager for mid-enterprise in Australia and is currently the head of Enterprise Greenfield based out of Amsterdam. All right, everyone, notice anything here? Katrin has traveled the world in the pursuit of building a multi-dimensional career. In her interview with us, we talk about this. Katrin says that most of us think of geography restrictions before picking out a role, but by simply removing that restriction from her mind, she found a way to travel the world, experience different cultures, all the while working on the latest technology. When we spoke about the pandemic and how it changed the way we work, Katrian inspired the three of us by talking about the boundaries that the pandemic has helped remove rather than talking about the restrictions that it set. We noticed that she has a very different approach to her work. She builds her job around the way she wants to live her life. We all know how difficult it is to do it and to achieve the balance. And the way she prioritizes her day and her annual year is pretty impressive and helps her achieve this. We talk a lot about what the future holds for a career in tech and what one should prioritize to build a career successfully. This is a must watch everyone. Enjoy and as usual, let us know what you think. We are back with a new episode for season two of the EITF project. And, you know, we've had very interesting guests for the season two so far, and this is going to be uh, 
Another very, very interesting interview. I'm going to be talking to Katrian Pegner. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. <laughs> but Katrian and I met in a Harvard course that we took over COVID. We took a course called Negotiation Mastery, and Katrian and I were given a project to negotiate with each other without knowing each other's motives. And I'm, I can tell you for sure that she won that negotiation fair and square. And, you know, I've been uh, friends with her on LinkedIn ever since. She's had some very interesting takes on very interesting topics. And I kind of chased her down to uh, do this EITF interview with us. So thank you so much for joining us, Katrian. Ah, thanks for having me. And uh, it was, it's, it's my pleasure. All right. So I'm going to dive right into the first question. What was the first achievement that you had in your career? And what was the first misstep that you had in your career? And what did you learn from either one? First achievement. I think that would be uh, my first job was uh, at Microsoft. And I met my manager. And uh, instead of giving me lots of detail or understanding, and I didn't know anything about Microsoft licensing at that time, also a disclaimer, they said, our goal is to reach 11 million uh, euros by this month. Go achieve it. And I'm like, okay, but you know, how, who, what, give me some context here. So I was like, okay, A, I need to study up, get Microsoft licensing certified. B, I need to understand our partner channel or ecosystem. And then I need to collect all this data to build a plan on not just achieving this, but you know, building a sustainable business. I realized that majority of our deals were not getting renewed because nobody understood licensing. So it would all drop off and then customers would not understand their environment. So I was like, how do we change it and think about what is the customer experience we want to give? So based on the data I built, I got a great colleague from mine uh, from data science came sit next to me. We built uh, actually at that time, a highly advanced workbook in Excel that gave us an overview on, we should be doing this, focusing on this. What are the scenarios that customers are, what are they using and what are the things we should help them? with as well. And then we would sh uh, share that with partners and everything, the top end uh, deals and engagements, I would go myself and build a, build a presentation, explain them. Within 10 months, I was able to A, blow that number out of the water, but more importantly, build a stable business where we had super positive customer feedback. So I think what was an achievement for me was A, I don't know how to get started on this to, okay, let's break this down in achievable goals. Let's learn, let's involve the right people and then build a plan. For me, it was a massive achievement at that time and uh, a, a massive learning as well that I think, yeah, you can apply in, in every role. First misstep, well, where do you get started? I think uh, that was my second, my second role at Microsoft. I mean, I could do the first one as well, but that was selling into government and selling into government. I assumed there would be like a company. Realizing when you sell into companies and government, it's highly different. A, there's way more hierarchy, but B, majority of these people work for government because they believe in the greater good, meaning they are there for a longer period of time. What I learned or my misstep was not really understanding their business and the business model they were in. What I did was I actually read the political plan or the issues for each city and really understood what was going on. So in some cities, it was uh, priority number one was safety. Other one was engagement with people moving into their cities. Another one was traffic management. So changing my approach from uh, this is another customer to no, this is not a cus this is a customer, but this is a government entity where they each have different requirements. And uh, until this day, I would never talk to a government agency if I don't really understand their political plans, their issues, and their requirements. So I think it sounds like a given, but when I was younger, I, I think, yeah, getting the context is, is key in anything you do. I, I love the lessons that you took away from both. I think for your first answer, uh, as someone that's new, that's entering a career space, the first project or something that's given to you can be so intimidating because uh, it's such a huge project sometimes. And I love that, you know, you took away from it that you had to break it down into smaller pieces 
of doable work uh, to achieve that goal. And congratulations on blowing that number out of the water. That seems like a huge number. And I, I love the second thing that you said too, that it's important to get context to what you're doing. It's important to ask the whys and the hows to do um, what you're doing. I think uh, some people tend to think that, you know, you're given something to do and you just have to go and do it without asking too many questions. And I think asking questions is a, is a very important thing. So great answer. Yeah, maybe to add on the politician side, what I also realize is a lot of these people work there for life. People who work for governments are there not for a quick win. They're there because they care about their citizens. And if you keep that in mind and you know that they're well connected, you can actually create a community that will focus on solving a lot of these issues collectively. So one, one of my big successes that I got out of my learning was instead of talking to one city or one government, is to bring them all together and, and create more of a community so we could solve this collectively. And I think that really resonated well. So my learning all always is like, okay, what are they trying to do? And are they all trying to do the same thing? And if, and if it would be safety, who are the other cities who are struggling with the same thing? And how do we solve this collectively? You talk about asking the questions in context, right? So you see a lot of consulting companies around or employees at work in companies where projects come from up above. How important is it for an employee to question the motive and do a thorough homework behind a customer's requirements and do a homework about customer's pain point in successfully executing a project? Uh, no, great question. And one of the things that we do uh, at AWS is working back with sessions. So it's design thinking workshops where we bring it back to the core. What is the customer need you're solving for? And I'll tell you, uh, I won't name the company. We do Amazon warehouse trips as well. And we take management teams and we show them how does Amazon innovate? And then we say, okay, what is it you want to achieve as a business? And one business told me, oh, we really want to use machine learning because we think that will solve all our issues. <laughs> I see you laughing, but you would be surprised how many companies say that. It's not a black box. And at the end of the day, what is it you're trying to solve? So we said, what are your customers saying? And they're like, how do you mean? What is the feedback from your customers? I'm like, okay, I'll make the question simple. I said, if you look at your customer support, what is the recurring issues you're getting? And what would solve that? And then they said, oh, when customers order something, they don't know where it is real time. B, when they order it, uh, we always promise them to get it in 24 hours. But once they click on it, the system doesn't show. Is it in stock? The customer doesn't know what, where, or when. So it was about supply chain visibility. And then we're like, okay, now we're talking about something. So I think 100%, you always need to challenge or understand what is the context? What are you trying to do? Because the goal is not to use technology. The goal ideally is to solve a customer problem or an opportunity that you see in the market. So I would always bring it back to start with the basics and then work your way back. And then whatever technology that you could leverage to solve that issue, maybe it is machine learning, maybe it's just creating visibility all, all up would be my advice. No, I think I like the takeaway, right? Don't use technology as a strategy, solve the problem and use technology as and when appropriate. And if it's machine learning, it's machine learning. If it's A plus B equal to C, it's as simple as that, as long as the problem is getting solved overall. Yeah, I think as people who are early in our careers, we get super excited when we get to work with new technology. We forget the reason why we're working, right? Every single moment that you spend at work is to serve a certain audience. And I feel like sometimes you... You get so invested in your work that you you tend to forget that you know there's someone on the other end that's waiting for this work. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask. Um, it's amazing to see where you've come and how far you've come in your career, and obviously you're really successful now. But uh, maybe at the like bigger picture level, I'd like to ask what when when you look back on your career, like what was the most significant challenge? Like nothing like specific, but maybe in terms of your your mental perception or just some kind of like idea that you had that you had to get over. Thanks for the compliment on, on seeing myself as successful. I think every time I, I achieve a goal that I want, I move my bar away. So to me, success is like, you know, I'm like this hamster on this hamster wheel. So every time I'm closer, I, I keep on running faster. But um, I think the thing that helped me 
uh, or maybe for your listeners would be, it has nothing to do with your age. It has nothing to do with what you have achieved. The, the best feedback or the best thing that I've ever heard that hit home for me actually came from, from uh, Satya Nadella, the, the CEO of, of Microsoft. And I was in the room when he said it. He said, don't wait for your next job to do your best work. And what that meant for me was we always say, when I'm a CEO or when I'm a VP of engineering, then I will achieve all these magical things. What are these magical things you want to achieve today? Go achieve them today. So what helped me in my career or what helped me accelerate in my career is a role is just a title. The title doesn't mean anything. It's what do I want to do with my, my focus? And every time I try to define that from the beginning, what does success look like in this role? And what's the impact I'm trying to have with customers? If I'm doing these two things, you can call me VP of nothing, but I'll get whatever role I want because I'm already doing the work. So I think for yourself, don't limit yourself and what you already can do in your current role and the rest will follow. It sounds simple, but uh, obviously it's not. No, yeah, that's great advice. So uh, you're basically saying don't wait to be excellent because if you are already excellent, then your goals will automatically follow because yeah, you're... Go do yeah. the work. I don't think it's about being excellent. It's about doing the work. You'll become excellent along the way and you'll get the excellent title along the way as well. Yeah, it's, I think one of the other things that I took away is don't wait for the title. Um, you can still, no one's stopping you from doing the job that the that you'll be doing when you get that big title, right? Um, you can still do it today and maybe you will learn something in your current role that will help you lead to doing better work when you finally get that title, right? 100%. So, and it's, and yeah. I think I, I, I see the trend, at least in the industry, right? Where you go ask someone for a promotion and the first thing they tell you is, hey, are you operating at that level? And like, okay, if say you are at level three and you want to go to level four, for the easiest thing to do is, hey, if you are operating at level four, then I'm going to give you that role and title that you duly want from us. Yeah, or maybe you'll so, get level five because you're already doing the work anyway. Yeah, so. obviously, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that actually leads me into my next question is how important do you think education is in playing a role in someone's career, right? There, uh, there are a lot of companies out there that won't hire, you know, anyone that has lesser than a master's or, um, you know, anyone that doesn't have a bachelor's degree and things like that, right? So what role do you think education plays? Not just, you know, at the beginning of your career, but like, you know, during your career as well. The learning never stops. If you ask me, you and I took a course in the, uh, in the, midst of our careers, right? We just wanted to go explore what was going on. So how important do you think education is? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a twofold answer. One, I've removed any education and any job descriptions that I hire for or that my segment hires for, because I don't think it's a requirement. On the other side, at AWS, we have a leadership principle called uh, learn and be curious. To me, learn and be curious, what does that mean? I am looking for people who love to learn. Does that mean you need to have whatever master's degree? No, it means you're easy to consume knowledge, retake the knowledge and build something new with it. So we live in a world where tech is constantly changing. Every year we're coming up with new features, with new models. Machine learning didn't exist 50 years ago. Okay, now we have a whole industry on it, new roles on it. So if we assume that everything will change, Having a skill set, meaning being able to learn, learn to learn. If you have that, I think you'll be very successful. So I believe in, do you need to have whatever formal education for a role? No. I do think your appetite to pick new things up, like in AWS, every month we have a new test, a new training that we need to complete. And then you can take on new trainings if you want. I like learning. I enjoy reading a ton of books. Why? I, I needed to stay ahead. I needed to be challenged. I needed to understand which direction things are going, what's changing. So I think, I don't know if that really answers your question. I think formal education for a role, I removed. I don't think that matters. But the appetite to learn, it, it, it's, yeah, the, the key to success. I think that's also a, uh, an important characteristic that you need to have to grow in your career, right? 
uh, like you said, tech is changing every day. If you are not someone who is like, I can say, for example, sometimes I'm, I'm a creature of habit. And when something changes on me, even in Jira, I complain about it all day, every day um, until I finally accept it. Right. So I think being op more open to change and learning what that change, how that change can help you. Yeah, that's that's big. How can you put yourself in the situation where you need to learn, where you need to have grit? Yeah. I'll give you a funny thing. You can go from a, a Windows device to an Apple device. It's an entire different operating system. Or you're used to uh, reading in a certain language. Why would you read another language? Why? Because if you put yourself in that situation and you keep on doing that, your brain gets used to change. I think nobody's used to change, but if you constantly put yourself in that situation, then it becomes your, your new normal, you know? I, I so for sure complained when I first got <laughs> my first first Mac. Yeah, I, I totally get That's a very good example. Uh, it's interesting you bring this whole leadership principle, right? Uh, at Amazon, the whole learn and be curious. And you talk about tech changing at, an, uh, at a rapid pace where there's innovation that's constantly happening. For an employee, what would be your advice for them to maneuver through an ever-changing environment? And B, what should organizations do to stay relevant? Because there's a lot of startups, there's a lot of SaaS-based companies, PaaS-based companies that are out there, a lot of venture capital that's getting fed into the space. So how do you ensure that you're always ahead of the curve so that you're not falling backwards when stuff may seem like it's going down south? I'll steal this one from Jeff Bezos. What he tells our company and what guides us, let's call it Northern Star or Southern or Northern Star if you're in the Northern Hemisphere. He's saying there's three things that don't change. Customer needs are always changing, but if you follow your customer needs, you'll always be relevant. Two is price. There's no customer that's saying make things radically more expensive. And three is customer experience and efficiency. If you keep these three things in mind, over time, it has never changed. As long as you follow customer needs, price and efficiency, you'll always be relevant. I really like that. And it challenged me sometimes to think, oh, what am I learning next? And I check my feedback. What are customers doing? Are customers buying versus building? Okay, they're buying more. What are the relevant SaaS solutions? Okay, have I spoken to the relevant SaaS companies? No. Okay, now every week I have a time slot about learning about new SaaS solutions and looking at what are people buying on the marketplace for AWS. And I ask feedback from customers on what is it that you're looking at and why. And based on that, I go and prioritize our team or efforts in that direction. So do you think we currently operate in a builder's market or a buyer's market uh, when it comes to adopting technology? Yeah, I think it's both. I don't think it's, it's one or the other. I think it's glue. It's like, if you have an Apple iPhone, you have an app store. Does that mean you don't need the Apple iPhone? No, you still need a device that connects everything together, but you'll have tons of apps coming and going along our lifetime. And I think the rate of new apps rising and declining is happening at a, a crazy rate. Look at Pokemon Go, for example. It exploded in no time, but they had, what was it, a, a billion users. So what are the new apps of our lifetime? I wish I could predict it, but I'm looking forward to uh, the coolest innovations coming your way. So we've been talking quite a bit about your work with uh, big tech companies like Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, but I was wondering in terms of your overall career strategy, if you'd ever thought about working with startups since they're also doing some cool, exciting work. So was that intentional on your part or would you like to in the future work with startups? 100%. So I did have some startups, one that we sold, uh, another one is still rocking. The reason I wanted to join a Microsoft, and in this case now an AWS, I wanted to go to a place where I had unlimited funding. Obviously, nothing is unlimited, but you know the, the gist. Where I had funding, where I had freedom, where I would be surrounded with the best people, and most importantly, where I would have access. What do I mean with access? I can almost call any CEO and probably get a meeting if I'm saying I'm calling from AWS. If I would be a random startup, I can imagine that would be a bit harder. So to me, my plan was, 
or how I see my career would be go learn uh, who's doing it the best in the market. Uh, when I joined with Microsoft now, AWS is definitely leading when it comes to tech and the access, the, the IS, the software companies that I'm meeting, the customers that I'm meeting. For example, I met the CFO of Netflix uh, a couple of weeks ago. He showed me around the Netflix office. We spoke about culture. We spoke about innovation. It's phenomenal, the, the, the learning and access I'm getting into what I'm currently doing. Uh, but I would love to 100% go into a scale up or a startup. Uh, and try something myself based on what I've learned, what I've seen and the access I have, because I think you, you need all three to be successful. Not saying there's one way, but that's definitely the way I've chosen to, to adopt so far. You, you just spoke about innovation and the thirst for knowledge that someone needs to have to, uh, to be able to grow in their career. You know, today, uh, this term moonlighting is getting a lot of attention. Right. In India, it's seen as a negative thing, as people working for two different companies, um, taking code and sharing with sharing with two different companies. We don't want to do that. Um, but the question about moonlighting that I have is, how do you think it can help someone? Like, for example, a lot of people that I have worked with um, have careers outside of work. Right. They try to work on things that are interesting to them that can lead to something that uh, that can lead to like maybe a second career or something. So how how important do you think it is to explore different avenues outside of work to build a multidimensional career? A job is what you choose to do and what you get paid for. Uh, I think everybody should and have passions outside of work. Uh, why? You never know what will bring what, where it will lead. You know, something can start as a passion project because you deeply care. Like for me, I love music and I ended up professionally DJing. I loved writing. I ended up writing for a newspaper. I love traveling. In this case, this is not a, a job, but think about what, what gives you joy. I don't want to sound doom and gloom, but we never know when uh, our time is done on this planet. Let's make it count. Let's do things that give us energy and see where they lead us. I really wanted to explore and move to New Zealand. I ended up in New Zealand. I didn't plan to go to Australia and they kept there asking over a year to move to Australia. I ended up there. I loved Australia. Uh, I always say some of my most random decisions are the things that gave me the most joy in life. COVID made me realize I wanted to be closer to my family again. And now I'm back in Europe, living in another country in Amsterdam. I'm super happy. I'm, I realize now how small Europe is and how easy it is to travel. If I hadn't lived in Australia, I would have never realized that, you know, taking a 26 hour plane to get anywhere makes you realize that very quickly. I like that. I, I actually thought that you were in Australia when I first reached out to you. I was surprised to find that you were not there anymore uh, and that you, you had moved back to um, Amsterdam. So one of the questions I have based on that is when you start over in a new country like that or in a new um, new place like that, because not a lot of us have the opportunity to do, to do that. But today that's becoming a trend even, right? To go and explore, to gain better experiences, to gain new experiences. What is the most important thing that an employee, say like yourself, who's starting over in a new organization, should concentrate on in a different country where they're starting? I always say, or I've learned it the hard way. And, and um, so I'd say there's three things in your life. There's your your family or your partner, there's your job, and there's the location. You can only change one out of three. Two is getting risky. If you change all three at the same time, you don't have any stability. So think about yourself as I have three pillars in life. I need to keep one always the same. If I change one, two is the maximum. So to me, moving countries, and I would say I've been really fortunate to be able to move and to go to different places. And I'm hundred percent sure I'll move. Why I feel it's not because you're born in a country, you belong to that country. It's just the place your parents were when you uh, arrived on this planet. I would highly recommend anybody to move because then you realize you are born with a vision. You're born in a culture, but there's many other cultures and all of them have their pluses and minuses. And the more cultures you experience, the more open your mindset becomes in creating new products, creating new services. Shadi.com, would that work in other countries? Would, would that work in other industries? Uh, what's working uh, 
in the Netherlands? Could that work in the Philippines? So I think mixing and blending, I think is even more important in a tech world where it's so easy to create something small, a prototype, a minimal lovable product, and then say, okay, what would happen if I would globally unleash this and where would it go next? So I don't think it's ever been a better time to create a, a, a tech company and export that across the world and see what, what comes from your fusion project. Yeah, that's a great answer. And it sounds like we've all been scarred by shadi.com in Jeff. Wait, <laughs> I was just going to say, I was wondering where your familiarity came from with shadi.com. It's a longer story, but I had uh, one of my best friends. He was single a while ago or many years ago. And uh, his mom asked me for advice and uh, helped me give access and help me review profiles and figure <laughs> out what was best for me. Now. So I immersed myself in Shadi.com and I was like, whoa, what? how would we make Shadi.com better? And I was like, what if we could combine it with machine learning and real-time recommendations? <laughs> and I was like, my mind was like exploding. I was like, we can take this to the next level. And I was like, what if we apply yeah. this to other things? So I actually love the idea of taking something what works in one place and then thinking, yeah. okay, how could I take this to the next level or even add things? It's That's just so you know, innovation. That would probably have been very popular. Very, <laughs> very popular. <laughs> okay. I am having an amazing time because of you talking about machine learning and what you could do potentially with machine learning to processes that can make it way better and more recommendations and real time personalization and all of that. You talk about exploring different countries, embracing its culture, et cetera. You work in a top tech company, which has global presence. So for you to want to go explore, say Germany, after Netherlands is going to be easy because you can just assume a role in say Munich or someplace like that. But for a person who's like, say in a regional based company or say, uh, at the very least a country based, uh, organization does the move to a new continent, or even let's talk about a country, uh, move to a new city. So does the choice of the destination follow the work? Or does the work follow where you migrate next? Um, if you're asking me, to me, one of the key reasons I love working for a multinational is exactly that. You know, you can go anywhere. There's no, almost no country on this planet that AWS does not have an office or has no intent to build an office. So the flexibility, 100%. To me, one of the things that COVID made me realize was I think this concept of being 12 months in one place is very old school. I think if there's a generation that has realized we want flexibility, we can work and live anywhere. I think it's our generation. So if I could describe my ideal state, it would be six months uh, in Australia, New Zealand, and six months in Europe to escape winter. I would sign tomorrow. Uh, and I am trying to figure out how do I create that lifestyle keeping Texas and the uh, and, and my partner in, in, in check as well uh, and making sure that they can do this as well. I do think there's more and more companies who are being present in multiple geos. So choosing what is the lifestyle that I want would, I think should be your starting point. And then which companies would enable you to have that lifestyle. So if you want to be two months of the year in India, uh, you want to be in the U S but you would love to be in Europe, which company would let you do that or which role would let you do that? I think you would be surprised how many roles uh, are becoming like that in the future. And even now already, I think COVID definitely made a lot of people be somewhere else because they couldn't travel. So yeah. on a related question, but slightly tangential, right, is you hear a lot of companies that want their employees to come back into the office uh, because they feel work from home is making them less productive. So they want them in their campuses so that they can do work. What are your thoughts on that? Like I, is work from home the new normal or was it a temporary shift that workplaces saw during the pandemic? I think it's a hybrid motion. Just how you think about what type of work requires what type of interaction? If I look at my calendar, it changes every week, but 
if I have tons of conference calls back to back, what's the point of me being in the office? I'll be just sitting in a phone booth uh, or in a meeting room doing conference calls. Clearly, there's no benefit of that. Do I believe in the power of being in one room, whiteboarding and solving issues? 100%. Nothing beats face-to-face -face when you're or trying to establish a new relationship or when you need to solve something in a group. Why getting a group of people on a video conference call? How easy is it to check out, not be engaged, or even have that level of interactivity? So I think if I think about my own team, next week, Wednesday, we're all coming to the office. Why? We're in operational planning too. So we, one of our key mechanisms is to write plan at the end of the year to say, what did we set out to do? What did we do? What went well? What didn't go well, but what did we learn? And what do we want to do differently? To do that exercise, I need people to whiteboard, put posters on the wall, challenge each other, be super interactive. Clearly, I don't want to do that on a, on a Zoom call. I would love to do that face to face. But that doesn't mean people can travel. I would even say creating the lock-in times of when do we need face-to-face -face time and when do we have conference calls? What is the, the goal of the meeting would be the starting point, I would say. That's great that you say that because I think one of the ways that COVID in general has changed the way that people work is that it has redefined people's motivations for working, your first answer that you gave. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of people around me saying that if they ask me to come back to office, there's no way I'm going to quit my job and go to another one. But I think, like you said, being in the office and being with people, there is an important essence to that. So I think working from home is definitely, you know, uh, advantageous, like you said, when you have a day full of meetings, but also working in the office, working in the offices shouldn't be fully ruled out. Yeah, especially for new people joining, you know, yeah. having the coffee conversation, listening into other people's meetings, it really ramps on their acceleration into their role. I've noticed yeah. new people especially struggle when they're at home doing onboarding videos. That's why yeah. I usually tell new people, go a bit more to the office, shadow meetings, listen in, yeah. learn, take your time. Building that connection or that level of trust is way easier to do face to face than on a video conference call. I had a question about your experience as a manager. So especially given COVID and all the challenges that we had with work from home and everything, was there like a learning curve or did everyone just kind of adapt to working from home? And like you're saying that you're totally fine with being like a hybrid model and like coming into work maybe once a week. But do you think that that's maybe affected the sense of like team spirit or anything if you're not seeing each other like day in and day out? And it's kind of impersonal just you know, working over Zoom or like just communicating over email? Has that ever been an issue that you've noticed? I would say COVID was a massive social experiment. I think uh, in the future, in 50 years, we'll look back and say, what was the biggest social experiment that happened in 2020 with me? What would happen if we would tell the entire world to be at home? I don't, I think it's too early to tell about the consequences, but I can definitely say in the beginning, people panicked. Why? It's a normal reaction. Changes. What will happen to my job? Uh, what would happen to my customers. And I told my team in the beginning, we don't know how long this will last. The only thing we know is if there's ever a time that customers need help and we can facilitate as a global tech company, it is today. So I said, if you're ever relevant, uh, it would be definitely today. And it accelerated tech adoption across the board because people had to use tools. People couldn't say, you know, I'm not going to use tech. Everybody had to. What we tried to do for social connection, and again, it was also trial and error. I didn't have the right answers. Was every we had daily stand-ups in the beginning that changed to three stand-ups a week. Why? Because we tried to find the right balance on how many times do people want to have a stand-up, how many times do you want to share what you're doing. We did have stronger buddy systems, so people who helped new joiners. We had culture mentors, so meaning senior Amazonians talking to new people to t talk about the culture and share about how we work. We played social games. So we played virtual video games. We did quizzes. We did virtual whiskey tastings, virtual wine tastings. We tried it all. I don't know there's one size fits all. I think it's just 
how do you deal with the situation and the social aspect of it? Some people struggled mentally more than others. So trying to do walking meetings, uh, telling the team from now on, all our one-on-ones are walking meetings. In this case, I lived in, in Sydney, so it was walking meetings on the beach. So they had the beach sound in the background it was very soothing. So we tried it all and I'm happy I can be out of the house, dress up, not wear my pajamas all day and really meet real people. I truly miss it. I realize I'm an extrovert. Um, so knowing how introverts dealt with it and sometimes not wanting to switch on their videos was a learning for me. Uh, we also did a communication evaluation on what are the styles of communication and, you know, the, the color codes, are you red, blue, green, or something else? And what is the way you want to be communicated with? So some people didn't want to do daily check-ins. They just needed the data. Others, you needed to check in with how they felt. So to me, one of the things I learned during COVID and my, my Sydney team can confirm was I needed to know uh, how everybody in my team wanted to be communicated with so I could change my management style according to uh, each of the individuals in my team. Uh, the way you that you handled it sounds fun, actually. Actually, speaking about managers, that leads me into my next question. You know, today there's a lot of talk about recession. There's a lot of talk about um, the economy uh, not doing so well. You know, at this point of time, we're recording this in November of 2022. We're kind of uh, heading into the end of the year and uh, we're all heading into our performance reviews, right? So what? how do you think an employee should prepare for a performance review versus how do you think a manager should prepare for one? And the second part to that question is what advice would you give a manager that wants to promote talent over seniority? Okay, multiple questions. How do you prepare for performance reviews? What did you say in the beginning you set out to do? How did you go along the way? Most importantly, what did you do with the learnings that you got along the way? And what did you achieve? And then I always ask, how did you impact others along the way when you figure these things out? Did you share it? Did you help others? Did you coach them on it because you figured it out in February while some people were struggling in July. How managers should prepare or how I prepare uh, with my management team is again, when did they start? So what's their tenure in the company? What did we agree on in the beginning? So we have uh, a beginning of the year and a mid-year check-in where the team presents every time what they say they're going to do, how they're tracking along the way. And then what did they do? So for us, it shouldn't be a surprise for any of the team because they know what they presented in January. They know what they presented in July. And we're now end of uh, or beginning of November. I already know and everybody in the team knows how they're tracking towards that. Most importantly is, is the learnings for me. What did they learn and how did they help others to really accelerate? And to me, I don't look at talent over tenure. I, in the beginning of my career, I did that. Now I look at it as who would solve it, how. So present what you would do. I don't care about your age. I don't care about your experience. I care about we're trying to build better partnering with technology partners. Present me a plan. So uh, I give uh, everybody in my team is a champion for a different initiative across the wider team. They each get to share it, present it and get feedback. And then I look at the end of the year again across these initiatives that we created champions for who really took it to the next level, who didn't do anything with their initiative and who didn't really get it. So. That also is quite clear because it's a project across the team. So you do need to collaborate with others. You do need to share what have you done with your initiative and how did you take that to the next level? So what was your date? What's the data that you have? What's the feedback from customers that you have, from partners that you have? What's the wider team saying? So that to me, the, the way I choose a person is I already give them the challenge before I give them the role. And if they do that successfully, like I promoted uh, Sinan in my team to become a manager. Uh, why? I already gave him specific people to coach and a specific challenge. And he rose to the occasion and he, he was highly successful. So I knew he was ready to manage people because he was already doing the work, like I said in the beginning. So I try to give people challenges and see how, what they do with them. I, I love that you said that because when you're doing your everyday job, you sometimes tend to lose sight of what that final goal is that you had set in the beginning of the year. My entire day sometimes becomes full of meetings that it's like, okay, I, to, 
I don't have a goal for the day. I'm just going to go sit down and whatever is thrown at me, I'll take it, right? But at the end of the day, I think it's important to sit and think about what I at least discussed with my manager at the beginning of the year to see if I am achieving that goal as well. One thing that really helps me, again, is breaking it down. So for me, I have yeah. every year, and I've been doing this for a while now, I set annual goals, personal, professional, yeah. financial, learnings, meditation, exercise. I even break it down to what does that mean a month and a week. Call me data driven here or a nerd, but it helps me realize looking at my calendar, did I have how many public speaking events? Did I take, how many books did I read? How many people did I promote? How many wins did I have? How many losses did I have? What did I learn from them? And looking at your life in a progress way, not in your only chasing a goal way, but the progress, where did I come from? Sometimes missing your goal is fine, but the progress that you made is huge. And then the following year, that goal is actually tiny because you've learned so much that you can speed up the following year. So think about it's okay to set highly ambitious goals, but then break it down in a monthly, weekly fashion. And if that's, I want to exercise more, I want to cook more, I want to meditate more. How do you hold yourself accountable? There's a book yeah. to read that keeps me, account holds me accountable. It's Atomic Habits. I actually read it once a year because every year I forget it again that I have good <laughs> habits and that I have bad habits. The goal yeah. is how do I make it so easy to have good habits and how do I make it so hard to have bad habits? It's interesting you talk about KPIs, right? Uh, KPIs can either be defined for personal goals and professional goals. You as a manager set KPIs for your team, like to promote someone. You see a lot of topics and a lot of articles about quiet quitting. Google keeps recommending me articles from the New York Times and Washington Post about how managers find it super hard to detect who the quiet quitters are. And nine or 10 times a manager is taken by surprise when a person leaves the organization. So in your opinion, is that KPI is not being defined properly to measure success or to keep a employee motivated enough to do work? Or are those misaligned priorities that the employee doesn't truly really care about? How do you read the situation? Because in my mind, when I read it, I'm like, okay, if KPIs are being set up, shouldn't that mean that the employee knows what is expected out of him? I'll, I'll say something controversial about this, but I think people leaving is not a bad thing. I think quiet quitting is 100% a result of COVID. People reflecting, I've been at home for two years. What do I really want to do? Or maybe, you know, making... A bit more money isn't the thing that's going to make me more happy. I want to live in a more affordable city. I want to travel more. I want to have more flexibility. I think quiet quitting is everybody reflecting, rethinking, and wants some time to figure it out. And I think we all should figure out what gives us joy, what gives us energy, and taking the time to travel or changing jobs or moving to a, another city, I think is, is great. I, I don't think anybody should be forced to do their jobs if they're not happy. I think everybody's clear on their KPIs. The question is, is this role fulfilling for you? Uh, and there's people who make their metrics. Sometimes it's related to they already know the job, they're really successful at it. But I also try to ask them like this is the role does this make you happy because at the end of the day don't do it for me do it for you so i don't i don't think quiet quitting is a new thing i think it's everybody coming out of COVID and showing some reflection i like that take too because quitting is not a negative thing per se um, I think it's just someone trying to make themselves better trying to figure out what they want quiet quitting can be something that organizations can pay attention to uh, but I don't think, you know, once you've decided, I don't think anybody can stop it. I think it's more about the candidate themselves rather than the organization. Katrian, this has been so much fun. I learned so much about you in this interview. I love that you've had so many different careers and I love your approach to your career in general, being open to everything. I think I, I love the way that you handled COVID with your team as well. Uh, that 
that just really stuck with me. So having said all of that, I'm coming to my last question here. How would you define success? Again, I think I said it at the beginning, but my definition of success is constantly changing. The thing that isn't changing is I want to be challenged. And I say the same thing to my team. The day you stop learning from me or in my team is the day you should look for another role in another team. My measurement of success, am I learning? Am I growing as a person? And I can say management. I, I now hire my first manager of managers and it was a learning for me, a new sports. Uh, so am I taking on new challenges? Am I getting energy? So if I look at my calendar, what gives me energy and what takes my energy, always make sure that I have more things that give me energy and traveling. So to me, the accountability is, am I seeing this planet? Am I experiencing new things? And am I learning? As long as I'm doing that, I, I am super successful. That's an amazing definition. I think in general that that shows your drive as well for your career. I don't know. I just feel like this interview was so broad and talking about so much, uh, so much about what people should be looking for and how multidimensional they can be, um, how important it is to try different things, to try different experiences, countries. Um, this is going to be very, very useful. A lot of our audience members are coming from different parts of the world, like the three of us are. I think what you had to say is, is going to help a lot of people as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, no, it, was, it was great to hear from you. Thank you. I think there's no magical answer. There's only, you know, magical experiences. So go and experience yeah. a lot of things. It's and... <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, do you Let's, post your um, DJ mixes on Instagram or TikTok? I'm on this old school thing called SoundCloud, but uh, I actually SoundCloud. stopped posting. I haven't oh. been on that for a while, but MixCloud is also really good. But um, I haven't been DJing lately or I haven't been posting lately because my day job has taken over um, and I've pivoted to going to concerts. So I do go to <laughs> concerts at least once a month, if not more, and playing a lot of squash. So um, sports cooking, traveling, uh, and music concerts are the thing that is taking over my spare time. DJing was more the, the earlier days or the, the starting point in my career. Always welcome in Amsterdam, guys. If you're ever around, sure. let me know. Awesome. Thank we'll you. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do.